In this episode, Tom and Megan take up Picard Season 2, Episode 5. In Picard Episode 5, Fly Me to the Moon, the supervisor introduces herself as Talon and explains to Picard that she is tasked with protecting his ancestor, Rene Picard, the woman whom Q had targeted earlier because Rene plays an important role in the future. Q approaches Dr. Adam Soong, a disgraced geneticist who is desperate to find a cure for his daughter Kor's terminal genetic illness. In exchange for a vial of medicine that can save Kor's life, Q requests Soong help dealing with Rene. Seven and Rafi break Ramos, or Rios rather, out of ICE custody and back on La Serena, the Queen taps into the ship's communication to broadcast an emergency call and lure a policeman onto the ship. Agnes shoots the Queen to prevent her from assimilating the policeman, but the dying Queen injects Agnes with Borg nanoprobes. Picard knows that Rene is destined to find a sentient organism on Jupiter's moon Io, and it is essential that she does not back out of the Europa mission. To monitor her pre-fight gala, Agnes infiltrates the event to hack the system so they can all attend, but the Borg Queen's consciousness is lurking within her mind. So, Megan, what attracted you to Fly Me to the Moon? (laughs) I really liked, first at the very beginning, the breakout of Rios from the ice bus, any type of heist is always really enjoyable. I thought Seven and Rafi made a great pair. It was a really fun bit of an action sequence. I thought that was a very strong opening to the episode. What was your favorite part? My favorite part was a pretty obscure reference, of course, to start the original series. Shocked down to my boots. (laughs) I know. And it was the supervisors. That term came from (laughs) TOS in a episode called Assignment Earth, where someone from the future named Gary Seven was sent back to Earth to prevent countries who were moving towards a nuclear war. And it was the only original series episode that was not a trailer, but it was supposed to be set up as his own series. And this was going to be the introductory episode. And um, Gary said there was two, two of the female characters are incredibly noteworthy. One was because his sort of aide-de-camp was Terry Garr, a very young Mm -hmm. Terry Garr, a very cute Terry Garr. Then the second, at the very end, Gary Seven has this black cat that follows him around. And you see the cat at the end, and it's this incredibly gorgeous woman sitting on the couch. (laughs) And, And... Terry Garr's character says, and who is that? And he said, that miss is my cat. <laughs> and you look back and it's a black cat. And this actress was on screen for five seconds, maybe mm-hmm. two. She had no lines. She didn't say meow or anything. And for 45 years, <laughs> her identity was unknown. Really? Yes. And no one knew who it was. And about five years ago, somebody figured it out. And she had gotten about $800 for the role, standard pay back then. And uh, in another Star Trek series I watch or listen to, they had all of the payment terms and her little union contract and all that. And she was interviewed on a podcast and apparently, and she was, had been a model and apparently she had to sit there naked while they wrapped her in whatever she was wearing. (laughs) And pinned it to her back. And it was a guy asking her. And, uh, so, oh, gosh, that must have been terrible. And he goes, oh, honey, I was a model. That's what we did all the time back then. <laughs> and she's completely matter of fact. Well, anyway, she's now, or at the time she was discovered, she was around 75. And it was just this crescendo of, of windfall of publicity. And she got all these paid speaking gigs, and she moved to the pantheon of women of Star Trek. Oh, Good for and her. That's for, delightful. For one, one role she had done years ago, and had never done really. That was the, not to say that was the pinnacle of her career, but those were the types of roles she had. And anyway, not that it made an impact on me. It's just a <laughs> historical footnote. But the line, that's my cat, 
It's <laughs> one of the great lines. But the Gary Seven as a supervisor really made sense in the context of this episode. But there were two other things or two other characters that struck me. One was the Leah Thompson character because she had been in Back to the Future 3. Yeah, she was on uh, the kind of the, that ethics board about the Adam Soon's work, right? Yeah, okay. Then there was a reference to someone called Dr. Vasily Roshinko. I had that one down too. <laughs> then you tell us who Dr. Vasily Roshinko is and why we need to bow down and worship to that name. Presumably an ancestor of the Roshenko family that adopted the orphan Klingon Worf, who had such a great role in TNG and DS9. Absolutely. And I guess it was, it must have been TNG, where his human brother appeared. And it was one of my favorite character actors, Paul oh, yeah. who typically played gruff Italian men or mafia people or something like that. I, anyway, he's a great actor, and he played Worf's brother, his half-brother, because he was human. So that that was a really fun next generation episode for me. Yeah, I found through this whole se- series, they're really playing with kind of who who was related to who in history, and it's, they really made the decision to make this almost with a really tight knit group of you know, individuals who stay connected throughout the timeline, which I thought was a really interesting choice. So, how did you feel about the precursor of New Adam Sung, the creator of the grandfather of the creator of War of uh, Data? Pretty mixed feelings. Eugenicists have rarely been on the right side of history, <laughs> just broadly speaking. It tends not to go well or be done with the, even if the motives are good, not having great outcomes. Arrogant, eccentric, interesting choice, I thought. And especially when you think about, I think if there was a quote in one of the very first episodes that he was attributed to him in the dark timeline, the dark present in Star Trek world of the only safe future's human future. I think that was attributed to him, and there's a statue of him, right, at the going into kind of the main of Star. Very pivotal character, obviously. And I think based on the work, what we've seen of him so far, it's hard to tell whether he's doing this work for love or for glory. So I thought, yeah, really interesting, but as of yet, unclear. Did we ever know before this episode that Picard had an ancestor who had gone into space? I think we knew that he was, had, he was the only one who had crossed the solar system which I think implies someone must have gone to space or he would have just said, I'm the first Picard to have gone to space. Oh, I should have said on Dr. Singh, when he's described as a disgraced oh. geneticist, is that, that must be a double secret probation if you're a disgraced <laughs> geneticist. Presumably. Presumably. So, I, had a, was, I had a question for you. I wanted to get your opinion on this. Why do you think they made the choice for that supervisor to look like Laris? What, um, what do you think they're trying to do with that? I thought... We have a few more kind of references to Romulans, but I thought they were, the way they have played with Romulans, the character and how we think of Romulans, and if you quit watching it, TNG or maybe even DS9, you still think they're the most evil bastards ever, just short of the Borg, at least until they joined the war against the Borg with us through Cisco's subterfuge. The... In Picard season one, obviously, there was the Romulans, and their legacy was very bad, and they were persecuted, hunted, killed, and that's not the Romulans that you and I grew up with, or certainly not the Romulans I grew up with. And so it's, I don't want to say it's a rehabilitation, because this happens in the past, but it shows the Romulans had been different, and at least in the past, and they were, and then... In season one, they were treated very differently, and Picard treated them very differently. So that maybe the exception was of the time frame of TOS, TNG, and maybe DS9 as well. And that really was the exception, not the rule. But I, I find it, it's not gender bending. It's something, it's like culture and race bending, our perception of them, mm-hmm. indeed. and I'm not quite sure what the word for that is, but it's making me reevaluate how I've always saw the Romulans. They perhaps always haven't been bad guys, but certainly in yeah. part season one, they had great pathos. The Romulan people had great pathos. I think Romulus had been destroyed. Yeah, in the first and season. And even if we go back to the last TNG movie, where the Reman was the praetor or whatever the head of the mm-hmm. Romulan government was called. So it's their... From a character who never evolved 
in TOS and TNG, we've seen a lot of evolution from Picard season one and now Picard season two in the past. I don't know. Is that too philosophical? No, I, and I, I, I like how they're doing that because they're opening up so many more avenues for different stories. Like, yeah, I, I think, yeah, it was an interesting choice. I, I like, plainly, they're going to go further with it. So we're only halfway through the season at this point. But There's yeah. one other thing I'd like to highlight. Yeah. Because I don't want to give away too much of Picard season three. But I'm seeing Have now... you watched it already? I was saving it till we get to watch it for... <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> But there's an incredibly poignant scene referencing Wolf 359. And I will disclose that I learned for the first time that 11,000 Starfleet officers and enlisted personnel died at Wolf 359, which I have not been aware of. And that, in many ways, that event shaped the Federation going forward in a way I had not really thought through. And we, but it's not simply the. De- I guess we defeated them. Humans defeated the Borg. But that event defined the character of many people. We'll see that a little bit later in one of the other episodes of season two. We talk with regard to Benjamin Sisko. But the Borg queen is still in Picard's head. And it's always going to be, she's always going to be in Picard's head. And Locuta as a Borg is always going to be a part of him. And he lives with that PTSD probably every day. And we saw just a hint of that, that her consciousness is still with him and that rears itself up at the most inopportune times. But no, And since we review that, those two episodes from TNG and refresh ourselves with that, that event really is a singular event within the Federation. And I, in a way, I had not really fully appreciated, even in rewatching the entire TNGs. Interesting. No, I think it's going to be interesting to keep exploring that. And I think, well, just as you mentioned, the Borg Queen and her kind of lingering presence. Of course, we've got the new Borg Queen and her growing relationship with Gerardi. And I was wondering watching this and the previous episodes, how much did Agnes know what was going on at this point, especially in this episode when she made the decision to shoot the Borg Queen so she wouldn't be able to assimilate the guard. Do do you think she has an awareness of how much she's playing with fire? Or does she just not know? I think she does. I think Agnes is not just playing chess while we're playing checkers. (laughs) <laughs> I think she's light years ahead of us. Mm-hmm. And when I say us, humans, in terms of what she sees, what we saw, what I saw in Picard season one was obviously a woman who became much more comfortable in her own skin, much more with the ability to articulate what was going on in her head. I have been like that where your brain won't stop. <laughs> and it's very difficult sometimes to control that without drugs or alcohol if you don't know what's going on. And I'm beginning to get get the sense that she's always been light years ahead of us. And the only way she could deal with that was to have the personality we saw at the start of season one, just almost not a cultural. Almost almost mechanical. Yeah. And incredibly stoic to be all the wrong things about stoicism, but (laughs) the wrong lessons from stoicism. But I think she knows, I think she sees, I think she sees it in her head. And I think she's playing the Borg Queen. Now, the Borg Queen's very smart, and she is playing on way past chess as well. <laughs> it's uh, interesting. I feel like they've been playing it almost like a courtship in a really a, interesting way. Yeah. That's that's a really insightful way because in many ways, a courtship is a conquest. Yeah. And, and maybe Agnes is also seeking a colleague as well as connection. So that's, yeah. I, I would say an equal. That's a really good point. Yeah. Cool. Anything else uh, really attract you about this one or interest no, you or any for more questions? That's pretty much what I had for this episode. We'll be getting a lot more into, of course, Renee Picard in the next episode. Right now, all we really know is that Q is messing around with her and does not have full capabilities of all his powers. So he's messing, I think, directly with individuals, which is maybe fun for him, but probably also quite frustrating. So more on that to come. All right. Well, I hope our listeners will come back and join us for episode six, two of one. I'm Tom Fox. And I'm Megan Doherty. Thanks for joining us. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you'll join Megan and I again in our next episode where we look at Picard Season 2, Episode 6, because That's What Heroes Do is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.